Turn, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Most of our text today is coming from there. Am I on? I am not. If you didn't get a book, we have several books. And uh, all you have to do is let me know if you're online or something and you need a copy. I'll get it to you somehow or other. Of course, I promised somebody a book and I forgot two weeks in a row now. Hmm. Not doing too good, I guess. <laughs> I would say write it down, but I got to read it too. So, <laughs> But uh, yeah, text me, whatever. I will do that. Sue, so, can you make a note? I owe Sam a book. <laughs> All right. Um, speaking of the books, the books are good to kind of give you an idea how the author looks at it. Uh, we are looking at the same basic text, but we're looking at it in a different approach, so you should get multiple lessons by doing this. Um, the way it's written this particular year seems to be a little strange. It's just kind of all over the place. But uh, anyway, it'll give you something to do that and go back to the Bible. That's where I always go when I start this lesson. So I want to read today, starting in uh, chapter 17, I want to read from verse 20. Early in the morning, David left the flock with the shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle position, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawn up on their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keepers of supplies and ran to the battle lines and greeted his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. David heard it. And when the Israelites saw that the man, the man, they all ran from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to divide Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. And David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills the Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the day you've given us. We thank you for your blessings, and we thank you for the blessing of your word. Guide us in all truth, in your son's name. Amen. Okay. Last week, we had uh, discussed the fact that God had given Israel a king. Um, they had cried out after all their problems and everything that they were dealing with. They had asked for God, uh, Samuel to appoint them a king to lead us just like all the other nations. And that's really the key. They kept seeing the other nations and they kept saying, we want that. Uh, so they uh, had rejected God as being their king. They still followed him as, their, as God through Samuel and the leadership of him to whatever degree that was, but they rejected him as their king. And as we pointed out from the very beginning, God was their king and moved ahead of them on their battles and on their leadership and where they went as he rode on the mercy seat or on the Ark of the Covenant as he led uh, them from there. Well, they had rejected him as being their king and they had requested that they have one that would go before them and fight their battles. That's what they saw in these battles with these other nations around them. So Samuel would be chosen by God to appoint the very first two kings. Last week we looked at those two kings briefly in their own heart. When he was introduced, he was introduced as an impressive young man without equal. He was from a wealthy family and a head taller than any others that were around him. So he stood out above them and would make a great leader to go before them in battle. You know, leading on, tall represented power, strength, leadership, all those things. So they uh, thought that he would be it, uh, a great king. The problem was, as the fact that he was chosen to be like those people around him and uh, like man around him in what man Crete, the island of Crete or the island of Cyprus. Others say that because they actually... Uh, 
are, these people are found all around the Mediterranean Sea in places that they, and that's why they're referred to a lot of times as the sea people in archaeology and history and whatever. Uh, the Bible says they're from Camp 4 or something like that, which nobody has any clue where that is or what that is. There's speculation, but, and the speculation is it's the island of Crete. But the reality is these people may have occupied Crete and came over there, but they were from all this greater region. They were a people that about the time that the Israelites left Egypt, when we talked about that in the last period of time, we talked about that, about the time that they start, came in and they started uh, uh, settling the coastline in Egypt. We find that um, this, during this period of time, and we find that uh, they settled here, but they weren't a strong people until... A little bit later on, during the time of the judges, is when they actually became stronger. When Joshua actually invades the land, what was that, 40 years after he left Egypt? They exist. They exist in five cities, five kings, five towns. Make sure I get this right. Uh, Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Gath, and Ekron. So we see that this right here, during the time of Joshua, at the end of Joshua's life, it says at the end of uh, Joshua in chapter 13, I think it is, they uh, talked about the fact that the Philistines were here and they were a people that had come into this. They were not in the original ones that God said to wipe out as being natives to this territory. And we talked about how they co controlled the sea right here, whereas Israel controlled the highlands. So we find that this battle, uh, as a matter of fact, Samson, this uh, battle to him. Remember, he killed a bunch of them with the jawbone of a donkey. All right, that was at the time that the Philistines were gaining more and more power and everything and strengthening over in this area. And also at that time, that's when Egypt pushed them out of Egypt and on up the coast. Okay? Now, you remember God told, and this is just an aside, but a little footnote. Remember, God told them, I don't want you to, when you leave Egypt, I want you to go this way, not this way. Guess what happened? They went this way. Right into the Philistine territory. They went around them. God didn't want them to go that way, plus that's the main road, and obviously uh, everybody be on the main road would be there to, to deal with. But the Philistines would have been in their path, and God brought them in a different path to come in and take this. His original path was up this way. All right, that's all aside. So here we are. We find the Philistines uh, are these people, and they are the problem for the Israelites and will be most of Israel's history. Um, <clears throat> all right, so chapter 17 says they had gathered their forces for war. They were dealing with Israel, which was the power in the hill country, and they were the power in the, uh, on the coastal lands. So they gathered together at a place, and we had said once before that uh, right here was kind of on the perimeter, on the outpost. Gibeah is where King Saul was from, and it was an outpost right on the border of between the, the, the territory that's being battled, because it's right here on the edge of the hills here. In addition to that, uh, we know that they had a champion. Uh, Philistines had a champion. Who was that? Goliath. We're going to talk about it a little bit more. You know where he's from? There's Gath. So you have Saul here and uh, Goliath here. Okay? And they're joining together for, to, to a battle to a place called the Valley of Elah. Valley of Elah, and I'm going to show you a little better, is right here. Okay? See if I can pull that up real quick. All right, there's Israel as a whole. Gaza, Ashdod, uh, Ashkel, whatever. Gath is in right in here. Uh, here's Jerusalem. Here's Hebron. Here's Bethlehem. That's where David is. And then we saw. Let me see. Here's Jerusalem. Bethlehem, here's north, this is north, this way, okay? So here's the valley of Elah, 
And it's still called that today, so they know where it is. And there's all these hills that reside right here and over here. And here's where the battle would take place. They shouted from one side to the other this valley. Okay? <clears throat> uh, just to be, give you an idea. Oh, that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> okay. Here, let's try this again. Let's don't close it. Let's open it. There we go. This is a picture or two of the valley there. Okay. All right. So this is what we're taking place. It's right in here, in this area right here. We're getting ready to have a battle. All right, so they're here. The Philistines gather. Saul and Israel meets them in the valley. Each occupied a separate hill. Um, I'm going to get that back. And uh, a champion named Goliath calls out to them for how many days? Forty. If you, somebody asks you the days that something happened, you know, if you just say forty... You'll have at least a 50% chance of being right. It's amazing how many times 40 days or 40 nights or whatever come to the equation. Every time that there is a struggle of any kind, 40 comes up. 40 days in the, uh, in the wilderness, 40 days, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. I mean, you just go on. But anyway, so here they were for 40 days there in this valley. Uh, between these uh, yelling at each other on both sides, lining up on their military, uh, threatening to go to war. And the Bible says that Saul and his soldiers were what? Skeered. Skeered. That's a good way to put it. The Bible says that they were dismayed and terrified or skeered. They were afraid. I think it's kind of interesting that they pinned so much on this one guy. But then again, when they appointed a king, what kind of king did they appoint? One big guy. You know, that's where they put all their hopes on. So he's challenging them uh, each and every day and night. Uh, says, will you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come, out, uh, come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, you'll be, you'll, we'll be your subjects. On the other hand, if I overcome and kill him, you can be our servants. So let's just do a uh, two-man battle, men or take all. Yeah, literally, that's basically the plan there. And then we find that uh, from that instance of where this battle's going on and what's going on over here, it's been there for 40 days, we find that in verse uh, 12, David is, uh, uh, dad says to David, well, first of all, David has six brothers, seven brothers. The first three brothers are in the military. So guess where they're at? Right here. So they're here, and David, is, his dad has him running back and forth. He's still the youngest of eight. Uh, boys, and he's back over here in Bethlehem. The hills of Bethlehem are actually over on this side, for the most part, where they do all the grazing and stuff. And so he's over here watching the sheep, but his dad sends him to the battlefield multiple times. We don't know how often, but he would take provisions to fight with. You know, they didn't bring in a big wagon train or a big military uh, convoy and drop it all off. That's not the way they operated. So they... Uh, sent provisions in, and David was the runner. So David's job was to take food to his brothers and bring what back to his dad? News, News information. If you've, if you've ever been around here and how hilly it is, they didn't have good cell service. So they had to send a runner. And so that was his job. He was a runner. Bring food in, bring uh, information back. So he would go back and forth, back and forth during this whole battle that was uh, set up to fight here. So he comes in and he comes up to the battle here. And as he arrives there, um, 
back and forth, take these provisions and bring back word. So early on the 40th day of the battle, David goes up to them and he takes uh, the food to him. And as he gets there, they're lining up for battle, just like we read earlier. They're lining up. And while they're lining up, he's, he drops the food off at the company clerk or whoever it is that hands out food, just, uh, supplies and stuff. And he runs out to the battle. He's a young guy. He wanted to see what was going on. You know, if I'm going to take the message back, I might as well have firsthand experience, right? Okay. Yeah. What is that scale of miles or kilometers? Um, well, this is in 3D. Yeah, I can't tell. Scale? I don't even see the scale. Well, that's 20,000 feet, but I think that has more to do with the elevation than it does uh, there. Here to Bethlehem to Jerusalem is such a long ways, three or four miles. <laughs> I didn't know that until I got there. You know, all my life I thought, there's Jerusalem and then there's Bethlehem, you know? No. <laughs> you sit in Jerusalem and you can stand, uh, pretty much from the mouth of Jerusalem, you can look and see Bethlehem. You know, because Jerusalem's on a high, higher point, so it's it's real close. It's not it's not that far, but it is a it's a hike. <laughs> you see all that terrain? Yeah. It's a hike. Probably take him a day at least to get there, maybe longer. I don't I don't know exactly. I'll I'll look it up by next week. All right. All right. So here he is. Uh, he hears this challenge, and the first thing he asks is he says, "What's in it for the guy who does this?" You know, here's this young guy, and he says, what, what, what do you get? And, uh, of course, everybody says, well, first of all, you're going to great wealth. Uh, you're going to be the son-in-law to the king. Pretty good. Even more importantly, no more taxes. You know, we all can go for that. No more taxes. Not just for you, but for your whole family. And so those great uh, things there. And he says, but who is this uncircumcised uh, Philistine, and how dare he uh, defy our God, Yahweh? You know, he knew who God was. He knew how God had helped him. He knew uh, what he had done for his people all these times. So here he is. He's saying, who is this guy? Why is everybody such afraid? What's going on here? And then we find that uh, his brothers heard about that. Um, and when they heard about it, what did uh, his oldest brother have to say about it? He was mad. He was mad. Just a looky-loo, that's how you are. Yeah, he said, you're just a conceited little boy. You have no business being here. You have a wicked heart. I think it's interesting that that was the words that his older brother used. Because his older brother actually represented Israel. The mentality of the soldiers that were fighting there under Saul. And what they saw David's heart was wicked. How did God see David's heart? After his, obedient, not afraid, you know, those kind of things. And so it's kind of a contrast, and his brother brings that out. His oldest brother brings that out. And we say his, he was burned with anger. I, I think it's more like jealousy. I think that's basically what the, the writer in the book indicated. And I, I, I think that's what it is. When you look at him, he was like, keep in mind, his brother had already seen him anointed. He really didn't understand that. You know, because Saul was king and he was out serving Saul. But he was brought in to go through this process too. And he was there when the sacrifice was made and all that. So he knew something was going on. To what degree, I'm not sure. But he knew that... Samuel had done something special for his little baby brother. <clears throat> and uh, so he, he probably had some jealousy. Remember how Joseph was treated when they were jealous of his relationship with God? Okay. All right. So we see this, that he was uh, and he's, uh, upset about it. And he thought he was conceited and wicked in heart. But the men of the battle keep talking about it and talking about this David and, and his brash statements that he was making about, what are you afraid of, you know? And so guess word gets to who? Saul. So suddenly Saul says, okay, bring this young man here. 
Let's see this guy that's not afraid. You know, so he brings him in, and this is the first time, probably, the first time that uh, David and Saul actually get together. So this is the first time that David comes in the presence of the king, and he is brought before him. And, uh, and he tells him, he says, uh, King, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Don't lose heart. Don't be worried about it. Your servant. See, he called himself a servant from the very beginning. Not your warrior, not your champion, your servant. Your servant will go and he'll fight them. And Saul's response was, but you're only a boy. What is that song? Only a boy named David. (laughs) You're only a boy. This Philistine, aside from the fact that he's a giant among men, Aside from all that, he has been a warrior since his youth up. And you're just a kid that's been out in the field being a shepherd. And David's response is pretty much along the lines of, yes, but as a shepherd, I've rescued sheep from many different things. And when the lion and the bear came and took my sheep, I didn't let the lion and the bear keep my sheep. I went and rescued them. And when the lion and the bear turned upon me to take them back, I wouldn't let them have it, and I killed them. How did I do it? I did it with God behind him. God helped him do that, and he says, and I can do the same thing with this Philistine because he has defied the armies of God. Didn't just defy God, but he defied God's armies. The ones who are fighting for him. These people have forgotten what all Joshua has done and how those armies were armies of God that God fought the battle and won it. It wasn't something they did. He says, but you don't defy God's armies and get away with it. I'll take care of it. He says, Yahweh will deliver me from the hand of these Philistines. Okay, so he basically, this is his introduction to him. And the reason I say that is, if, you're, if you've read your scriptures, <clears throat> after David is anointed, we find a little, and there is a mention of the fact that he was given the spirit, and the spirit was taken away from <coughs> Saul. And so Saul actually ha- ended up with a, an evil spirit that would torment him and cause him great pain and agony or whatever. And so he looked for a harpist, someone to come play a harp, and David would come and do that. In the the text, it comes before David and Goliath. In reality, he probably, it it didn't happen then. It was more just mentioned then because it was talking about the spirit being taken and given and all that. In reality, this probably took place at a later date. And the reason I say that, you know, first of all, different people say it, but I don't always go by that. Now, it could be either way, and I'm not going to argue that, but uh, the reason I said that is it says, oh, great. Right, but when you talk about uh, him giving the, uh, playing the harp, it talks about the fact that uh, he was a great warrior, that he was a warrior. Uh, That he was, ah, I had it written down. I have to find it again. It's in chapter 16 near the end, and I'm trying to finish and jump around. They found a a warrior. Oh, here he is. Uh, In verse 18, it says, I have seen a son of Jesse who knows how to play the harp. He is a brave man and a warrior. So when he's called to play the harp, he's a warrior. He's not a shepherd at that time so he's already been made a warrior in there so probably that was just put in there related to the uh, uh the passing of the spirit and the tormenting spirit but anyway and we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail next week all right so basically that brings us up to introduction to saul the fact that saul has the attitude and the concept that he is out here to fight this battle it is his job to lead these armies it is up to him to defeat the Philistines. 
And he doesn't know what to do because he's afraid, dismayed, and whatever the other word, scared. They're all scared, and he doesn't know what to do. You don't see him jumping out there and saying, I'm a head and tall above y'all, so I'll go do it. He doesn't do that. And we find this young man coming in here who's a shepherd, not a warrior, comes up and meets him and says, hey, I can handle it. Why? Because God is on my side. Saul has already demonstrated that he didn't use God to be on his side from the very beginning. It was always about what Saul could accomplish, not what he could accomplish with God. David says, I can accomplish it with David. So you see this contrasting thing taking place right before the battle with Goliath. And that's really what I wanted to concentrate on today is the introduction, the bringing together of the two types of kings and why God was taking and getting rid of the one and replacing him with the other. That's what you see here. And it's David's introduction to what would become his position later on as king. It's introducing him and putting him into the contact with the family there. All right. Now. As I've stated on this particular class, what I want to do is, as we look at these, is kind of think about it, that G David is kind of like the type for, uh, for Christ, for Jesus. <clears throat> There's so much similarities, and they always talk about uh, Christ being a more perfect king like David and uh, sit on David's throne, all those things. It always goes back to David. <clears throat> like David, uh, Jesus was a shepherd of his people. He didn't come out as a warrior. He came out as a shepherd. David came as a shepherd. Both of them would take on the enemies of God. But both of them would come at it as a shepherd does. It's interesting that throughout the entire Old Testament, all people who lead God's people are called shepherds. You see, a shepherd was one who looked after something that belonged to somebody else. And that's what God's people and his leaders have always been. That's why one of the uh, titles or functions, I should say, of an elder in the church is to be a shepherd. It's someone as a leader who, who looks after something that belongs to God. That's what David was. That's what Moses was. Every one of them were called to look after God's people. And that's exactly what David would do. He's going to come in as a shepherd who physically took care of physical sheep, but he's going to shepherd the people of God for the next 40 or 50 years. I don't remember exactly. And uh, he would shepherd them and take care of them and do what a shepherd does. And a shepherd basically leads them, provides for them, and protects them, even to the point of willingly giving his life. And we see that Jesus did all of that, even to the point that he did give his life to defeat uh, the enemies of, of uh, God's people. All right. In addition to that, Jesus had uh, similar relations with his brothers. How did Jesus' brothers react to Jesus being the Messiah? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, you're the, yeah, I've known you just like the rest of the people who went to church with him or went to synagogue with him. Yeah, we've known this kid since he was little. Yeah, right. Yeah. But they knew there was something special about Jesus, the way he behaved, the fact that he, and the stories that went along with his birth. They knew these things, but they still had no understanding of the, of the big picture. It's the same thing with David's brothers. They didn't understand the big picture. They knew something was going on, but they never understood how he was going to be the king of Israel. And because of that, like most people, they were a little bit jealous and a little bit put off at this kid who they considered just one of their brothers in the same way they treated Jesus. As a matter of fact, even when Jesus was doing his ministry and they should have been getting a clearer picture, they were like, shh, quit that. You know, They went and tried to get him and go away and quit talking like that. You're going to get yourself in trouble. So they didn't understand. So... It's a couple things that are parallels with Christ there. Anything else? I never thought about this until right now. When okay. Talking about the brothers in Christ. Can you imagine the conversations maybe that Barry had with all the rest of them? Yeah. Telling them, now look, this is the way this happened. Yeah. <laughs> Where did now, babies come know, from? Well... Talk about the stork. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, 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 that
And then you talk about the real birds and the bees. Well, this doesn't apply to any of that. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, and their thought was like, sure, okay, just like a lot of people, you know. I mean, it was very clear uh, Joseph was afraid because of his position. He went sought to put her away privately because no matter what, it, did, it, it didn't add up. So, yeah. All right, next week we're going to take a look. We're going to look at Lesson 3, which is really the battle with Goliath. And we'll also take a look at a little bit of chapter uh, in between the two, or right after that, and the chapter right before it, the last part of 16. Basically dealing with the struggles that Saul had with David in the aftermath.